Welcome fellow Hearthstoneians, I'm Polish King and this is Deck Dissection. In this episode we'll be covering Shaman, its strengths, its current place in the metagame, and why you should be playing it on the field of battle. Before we get into specific cards, I want to talk about the class as a whole and explain how a powerful mid-range strategy is so viable in the current metagame when all you see are extremes in control and aggro in the form of Murloc, Hunter, uh, Warrior, and Warlock handlock decks. Well, the thing is the flexibility of Shaman is really unmatched. You have very powerful, efficient threats that can stand alone reasonably well, and that allows you to beat the control decks and have good finishers to end the game, while you have extremely efficient removal in the form of lightning bolts and rock biters to take out early creatures against aggressive strategies. And you have very easy ways to net card advantage in the form of your totems. So let's take a look at some of the cards that abuse these uh, particular aspects of the class. Flame Tongue Totem is excellent as oftentimes you won't have a very powerful play or you won't have a play at all on your turn so you'll simply make a totem and pass. And your opponent for instance plays a Flame Imp or a Shattered Sun Cleric you have the ability to, to play a Flame Tongue Totem which is extremely efficient. It's usually four power for two mana and clear your opponent's board or trade with them without actually losing any cards. This nets you general card advantage, which is extremely important moving into the mid game where the Shaman deck really shines. So we have cards like Earth Elemental, uh, one of the key cards in Shaman until late, uh, as the metagame has shifted to more of an extreme stance in control or aggro, where an Earth Elemental doesn't exactly fit in, and it's very vulnerable to removal and a lot of classes can pretty efficiently remove an Earth Elemental, and since you're actually paying 8 mana with an Overload of 3, it's a little bit dangerous as it uh, deters a lot of your turn 6 plays in the form of Fire Elementals, or Cairns, or um, Argent Commanders. Those cards are very powerful and they really want to be coming out on curve, as they often net you such a supreme board advantage that you can overtake your opponents. Uh, but this definitely illustrates the powers of Shaman and the cards that we'll be expecting and to see in our decks. Now, cards like Lightning Storm are very good catch-all. Even though a card like Lightning Storm is typically dead against control, uh, it can remove very various threats that you don't want to have your creatures interact with. Uh, oftentimes, you'll be able to summon a spell power totem or play a uh, spell power creature so that you can get rid of a frothing berserker or an armor smith, or just a general nuisance threat early on that you wouldn't want to get rid of uh, damaging your creature any other way because you need to pressure the life total of control decks. And this card is particularly powerful against um, all the aggressive decks. It's very efficiently costed at 3 mana. It does, however, overload you, so it's really a 5 mana load that you're paying half up front and half later. Uh, but because of its efficiency and the ability to play it in the early game, you can net yourself an extremely powerful advantage and if you're able to hold the card and sculpt yourself into a board position where you have your opponent overextended you can find a lot more value. Oftentimes a lightning storm is a 3 for 1 in terms of card advantage or a 4 for 1 and oftentimes your opponent just can't come back from that type of swing. So let's jump into the deck. Now this shaman deck I actually played myself to legend uh, I was struggling in the metagame, I was playing a lot of control decks and mid-range decks and they just weren't working out for me and uh, I spoke to one of my friends, MITJDW, and he came to me and he said, listen, I have a really powerful Shaman deck, I've been playing it forever, and he was top of ladder on Legend, so I was like, okay man, send me a list, and I just couldn't believe the numbers that he had in it. The deck seemed very nonsensical, but once I walked through it with him, I understood his game plan and his strategies, and as such, we'll be looking at this particular deck, and then several iterations for your specific class ranking. As I know, the, the higher ranks are typically more aggressive decks, and the lower ranks are typically more controlling. We'll be able to adjust your deck more accordingly to where you sit on the current ladder. All right, so let's look at the deck. Okay, so we see here it's very generic looking at the start. Um, Earthshock is a very good catch-all versus... Cairn and the control decks because they don't often play many threats and if you can deal with their threats efficiently then you, they'll have problems trying to pressure you and kill you in the later game. 
Uh, but it also takes care of Leopard Gnomes and Argent Squires, which are a big problem. When your aggressive decks try to snowball you, they really try to pressure your total, life total as early as possible, and cards like Earthshock prevent that. They also stop cards like Nat Pagel or Mana Totems, Mana Tie Totems from drawing cards. So it's a very versatile one mana removal spell that has the additional ability to silence very uh, powerful creatures. Lightning Bolt is the most essential removal for this deck. Um, it is also the most efficient removal in the game in that it doesn't make you discard a card. Soul Fire is also debatable, debatably a, a very efficient removal spell, but the discard effect can be uh, tenuous as sometimes you lose your best cards and can't apply board pressure after you Soul Fire. Now, what Lightning Bolt does is remove early threats and synergize with your unbound elementals. This card will let you get rid of problem creatures with spell power can get rid of four toughness creatures which is extremely big. You'll often be able to control the board fairly easily at a very low cost to yourself uh, and it's a quintessential card for the deck. Rockbiter is just Lightning Bolt 3 and 4. Um, it synergizes very well however with our one copy of Doomhammer in this deck and will oftentimes give you an edge versus the field as it's an unexpected three damage uh, that you can apply to even a totem to remove a creature and save your life total. Now we only have one copy of Argent Squire. While this is a very important card in Shaman decks because it synergizes so well with Flame Tongue Totem and Defender of Argus, it's a liability against Hunter and Hunter is extremely prevalent in the metagame right now so we typically tend to stray away from Argent Squires. Now there is still one copy in the deck which uh, is a nod to the strength of the card and the, it, the way it sits in the Shaman decks and I think that one is probably the right number if you're looking to face a very diverse metagame. I could see going to two Argent Squires against slower metagames as the buff from Flame Tongue Totem and uh, your Defender of Argus are just too much to not have this card to your deck. We have one copy of Blood Mage Thalanos as a utility card. It just strengthens your Lightning Storms, your Lightning Bolts, your Earth Shocks, and makes all your cards generally better, which is, for a Shaman is very important. Um, you really want to be able to remove creatures as efficiently as possible and dictate board control in the early turns of the game or in the later turns of the game when they start playing heavy threats you don't want to sacrifice as much of your board so if you can trade one of your feral spirits with um, a druid of the claw and a lightning bolt then that's very good value for you so we also have flame tongue totem you'll see one copy here the main reason we are running one copy of flame tongue totem in this deck is because against more aggressive board clear strategies you have trouble sustaining creatures. And when you can't keep creatures on the field, the Flame Tongue Totem is basically a discarded card. You're just unable to play this card. So it often sits dead in your hand as you're being killed. As a result, we've played one copy. Just because the Warlock decks tend to have much better board clear in the form of early game creatures, and typically your, sh your Shaman Totems won't stick around, even against other decks um, that play just uh, weapons or any type of early game clear, they'll often remove your totems because they realize how much of a liability it can be later in the game. As a result, we've cut down to just one Flame Tongue Totem. Feral Spirit is an extremely strong card. It's just so powerful for what it does. Even though at the cost of 5 mana and overload of 2, you get two two threes with Taunt. Now against Hunter, against uh, Warlock, against Druid, against every class, I'm happy to see a Feral Spirit. Typically won't mulligan it out of my opening hand. This card is just so powerful. If you time it accordingly with your curve, you'll find that often you'll net an advantage that your opponents can't overcome, and you can easily take the game from them. So if Lightning Bolt is the most efficient hard removal spell in the game, uh, a soft removal spell in the game. Hex is the most efficient hard removal spell in the game, in that it, no matter what creature they play, you remove the creature from the game and give them an 0-1 frog, which is extremely powerful. I don't know if you've ever played against a Ysera, a Rag, a Ragnaros, or Cairn. Many legendary creatures are just so difficult to take off the field. Even as a value card, it often generates you much more mana uh, because your opponent, let's say, spends five mana on a Druid of the Claw while you have five power on board in the form of, let's say, an Argent Squire and Feral Spirits. Now, you hex that Druid of the Claw, 
and attack your Argent Squire into it and then hit him for four. He's just spent his turn doing nothing while you can use that last two mana you have to generate an additional totem. So this card is just very powerful uh, in its own right. Uh, it also removes Iron Bark Protectors and Ancients of War. It basically makes large creatures not viably competitive against a Shaman and can against Warlock Control be so devastating to remove Molten Giants and Mountain Giants with ease when those are really the hard-hitting cards that Warlock needs to close out the game or protect their life total. Now Lightning Storm, this is your quintessential catch-all removal spell for aggro and mid-range decks. Typically they'll need to overload the board versus a Shaman in terms of creatures in play just because they need to pressure you since you're so good at removing creatures. Lightning Storm gives you the ability to punish those overcommitments by destroying all the creatures in play, usually with a, a Spell Power Totem or a Blood Mage. Occasionally, it's just fine on its own, dealing 2 to 3 damage to everything. Uh, Manatai Totem gives you that longevity that you're looking for in a mid-range strategy. When you play very long, drawn-out games, you'll usually sculpt your board position when you have one of these in hand to protect yourself and protect the Manatai Totem and that so that you can generate enough card advantage to make it worth it to play. Oftentimes when you receive three cards off a Manatai Totem it's very difficult to lose the game. The card is just very powerful in its own right. It's a Nat Pagel on steroids for an additional mana. Now that being said, Manatai Totem is also um, a very bad card in that it doesn't affect the board. So it's very risky to play for three mana, especially in the early turns of the game and can be bad to be drawn in multiples. As a result, the deck plays one, and I think one is really the sweet spot for mana tide totems, unless we see the metagame slowing down drastically. With uh, hunter combo decks and all these aggro decks in the format, it's just too much of a liability. Uh, Unbound Elemental is the card, premier card to synergize with all your overload effects in the deck, and there's quite a few overload effects. Uh, this guy can become a monstrous threat on his own, and oftentimes will draw removal from your opponent straight away, as a 3-5 for 3 mana is very scary, and oftentimes much more difficult to deal with than its 2-4 counterpart when you initially play the card. Uh, Unbound Elementals are really good when you play them a turn later, with uh, an overload spell like a lightning bolt so that you get generate value right away and make them much more difficult to remove. However, oftentimes playing them on curve can just be backbreaking in itself. Uh, Argent Defenders, or Defenders of Argus, <laughs> I apologize, are just generic control cards in that they put up walls and prevent you from being attacked and they strengthen everything around them. So imagine you have uh, a 3-5 or a 4-6 Unbound Elemental and an Argent Squire in play. You just played a Defender of Argus. That's just backbreaking tempo. Now you have two very powerful creatures and a 5-7 and a 2-2 Divine Shield that can basically remove any creatures in play for free and give you uh, unadulterated reign over all of the field of battle. So Defender of Argus is definitely backbreaking and it allows you to play around cards like Explosive Trap, uh, Holy Nova, and consecrate as they all deal a hard two damage. Two damage is, is the key that we want to, the threshold that we want to get above. Whenever we have any way of doing that, such as Defender of Argus or Shattered Suns, cards that just generally buff creatures so that they don't die to general board removal uh, is very, very good. Now, the Gnomish Inventor is a very good card draw mechanic with a sizable, durable body against aggro. So when you're playing a 2-4, let's say you're on the draw and you're coining out the 2-4 and it draws you a card, it allows you to remove two creatures on average from your opponent's side of the board as they're usually 3-2s and 2-1s against aggro. But against control, it gives you a reasonable body that uh, can pressure their life total in addition to drawing you a card so the body is free. So when they go to answer it, you've generated a little bit more tempo than them. Uh, Shenzhen Shieldmaster is very necessary in the current metagame against Hunter. Um, we will be going through an iteration of this deck that's more uh, specifically tailored to beat Hunter, but the card itself is just very powerful. Uh, a 3-5 for 4 with Taunt is just supremely efficient, uh, matched only by Chillwin Yeti. Um, and the card often stalls out all aggressive game plans, and with the ability to buff the card that you have, uh, it's very easy to turn Sunjin Shieldmaster into a viable threat and to uh, protect yourself long enough to overwhelm the board and take over the game. 
Doomhammer is a one of in the deck. It is very powerful against creature strategies and control alike. This is one of my favorite, most versatile cards in the deck, uh, coupled with Rock Biter especially. I don't know if you've ever played a Rock Biter on a Doomhammer on turn six, kill the Chillwind Yeti, and then attack their face for five. But the feeling is supreme. <laughs> it lava burst you and remove your creature is what it says. Um, that being said, Doomhammer is a little bit clunky, which is why we only see one of Doomhammer in the deck. But against Control Warrior, it can do very powerful things in uh, removing their board presence or removing all of their sh their armor so that they can't shield slam your later threats. Uh, against aggro, once you've stabilized, you can play the Doom Hammer and just take out the two creatures that they can play each turn life tapping as they draw off the top of their deck. The card's very versatile. And in the Shaman Mirror, it lets you clear the board very quickly and very efficiently. At the cost of seven mana with its overload, I think it's a bargain. Uh, Azure Drake, this card, we just want to maximize our spell damage increases and cantrip. It's just a very efficient 5-drop. As you see, a lot of this deck just cycles through itself so that you can keep constant pressure on your opponents because that's what the game is all about. Uh, and you always want to have cards in hand because you want to hold answers for their really particularly strong threats. Uh, this way they can never come back into the game. Now the mid-range strategies are all about this, taking the game to the mid-range uh, stage where it turns four through seven and you can really just power out strong creatures that recycle themselves and that your opponents have a hard time answering. Our next card is Gadgetan Auctioneer with so many spells in the deck in the forms of earth shocks, bolts, rock biters, ferals, hexes, lightning storms. You're just always guaranteed cards from Gadgetan Auctioneer. Now granted the card really needs to come out late in order to, to receive proper value, usually you'll play it on turn 7 where you can cast two 1 mana removal spells, or turn 8 where you can play a Feral Wolves to protect it, but the card really does wonders for itself. It's basically just an additional Azure Drake that uh, occasionally won't net you value, but oftentimes can net you more value. So as we say, this card has a very high ceiling and a very low end where it's very easy to remove and if it's removed you lose a card but if it's not removed you'll just generate so much tempo and value off of it that your opponent won't be able to come back in the match because all your spells will become basically free cantrips cantrips are uh, cards that allow you to draw a card when they're cast now the next cards that we have here are two cairns, or one cairn and two fire elementals these all serve the same role Karen and Fire Elemental are instrumental in being very powerful threats that are difficult to remove because they have 5 toughness, which is a very quintessential number in this game. 5 is typically the number that you'll find that your opponent needs to spend 2 to 3 cards to get the creature off the battlefield. Uh, the Battle Cry on Fire Elemental is so powerful. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it's played over Ar Argent Commander in this deck, because the 3 damage that it deals is so relevant. Just removing a creature and then threatening them with a 6-5 body usually can end the game on its own. Uh, Karen is also very difficult to remove. If you're having trouble keeping creatures on the battlefield, Karen is exactly what you want. He'll recycle himself and draw additional cards out of their hand. As you can see, this whole deck is about value. We're just trying to outvalue our opponents, make them spend all the cards in their hand defending themselves while we beat them down and slowly kill them. The last card that we have in the deck is Rag. Now this is actually uh, toss-up. You can play Ragnaros or um, Alakir. I think Alakir is a very powerful threat in its own right, but we already have Doomhammer to capitalize on our Rockbiter weapon. So playing another target that you need to save Rockbiter for is not one of my favorite things. Also, Alakir is very low impact if you don't have ways to exploit him. Just because Siphon Soul is in the format, it's very easy to remove. Um, also, Ragnaros will oftentimes um, kill a mountain giant or a molten giant, whereas Alakir wouldn't be able to do so without additional assistance from other creatures. And uh, I think Rag is just a more surefire threat in the current metagame. Alright, so we've looked over MIT's Shaman deck and understand why Shaman decks are so good. Let's look at different variations for different expected metagames. Let's check out Hunters. Okay, so you're going to be playing tons of Hunters up the ladder. And it's going to be a pain for you. 
This is why the deck has been adjusted to beat these hunters. You'll see that we didn't add additional Argent Squires. People might be saying, oh, but Argent Squire is just a, an efficient one drop. It can pressure them, kill creatures. Hunter decks typically won't be playing creatures. They might play Leper Gnomes, they might play their animal companions, but by and large, they don't play many creatures throughout the course of the game. So Argent Squires are just too much of a liability to unleash the Hounds. Usually you need to keep yourself on two creatures on the battlefield. Even making totems is, is a potentially disastrous situation, just because once they get a leash out um, with a buzzard for four or five, you'll find that it's very hard to come back in the game because of the card advantage they've net from you. So I would even sparsely make totems in the Hunter matchup, as they are very much a liability. You'll see that we added an Acidic Swamp Ooze because their weapon is so instrumental in the matchup. Their secrets are reasonable cards, but they only become extremely powerful when you have when you couple them with an eagle horn bow. And if you're destroying the bow, then you don't have them net that card advantage they really expect to have, or the tempo advantage that they really expect to have to be able to deal five damage to you in the, on their turn with their weapon and their hero power. So it's uh, very backbreaking to just swamp ooze them out of the game. It also helps you against early aggressive warrior decks that might play their axes um, and rogues that can deadly poison themselves. Um, another change that we've made to the deck is adding a second shield master. Shield master is just so potent of a threat and really stops all aggressive decks in their tracks. It's such a powerful card that we're willing to play an additional copy of it even though it's pretty much a vanilla creature because of its high durability and its ability to stop uh, people from pressuring our life total. So these are just the, the small changes. You'll see that uh, we took out the Blood Mage because it's not really too particularly powerful, but the core of the deck stays about the same just because it's already so versatile against creatures with Earth Shocks, Rock Biters, and Lightning Bolts that you don't need to adjust much. We just really need a way to keep them off our life total so we can establish a strong ground game and attack them from afterwards. Um, the next version of the deck we'll be talking about is an anti-control variant. You'll see in this variant we actually added the second Argent Squire. The card itself is just too powerful, uh, especially since we are adding an additional Flame Tongue Totem. We definitely want to have that synergy. Just three, a 3-1 three with a Divine Shield is so difficult for most decks to remove, and oftentimes it'll deal 6, 7, 8 damage before they can finally get rid of it. And by then it's already far supremely uh, surpassed its worth. So definitely double flame tongue is very good against control as well and double argent squire because the flame tongue you'll generate totem value against control decks and much slower decks uh, that will let your flame tongues be much more potent than they would be against aggressive board clear decks. Uh, so flame t having more flame tongues is less of a liability in these matchups. You really want to play these types of decks against Druid, against Control Warrior, against Control Warlock, where you don't have to commit many cards to the board to have a potent threat and force them to blow a Hellfire early or a Shadow Flame early. Uh, we still have the same amount of Ferals. Ferals is just a good card in every matchup. I never mulligan this card. We have, however, cut a Lightning Storm for a Lava Burst. So the reason we've done this is because the spike damage from Lava Burst deals with a lot of those five toughness threats that I said are very difficult to deal with in the form of Chillwin Yetis. And with a card like Thalanos in play, you can deal six and get rid of Druids of the Claw. You can get rid of Giants very easily with a Lava Burst and additional creature. Like a Lava Burst and a Rockbiter weapon often get rid of a Giant themselves. So you can just keep pushing through and attacking your opponent's life total. Um, we have replaced all of our shield masters with a more efficient chill win yeti. The reason we've moved to the chill win yeti is the additional power. The taunt isn't very relevant when you're playing against many control decks, and the additional point of power could be. Uh, making it a 5-6 is also very powerful with Defender of Argus, and can just close out the game. The rest of the deck is pretty much a very similar build. Um, against control decks, I might swap out my Ragnaros for an Alakir, just because uh, Alakir could be a little bit of a harder threat to deal with when they can't remove Divine Shields. However, with hard removal like Siphon Soul, I still really like Ragnaros just dealing 8 to the face before it dies, and oftentimes it deals with Giants on its own. And just having a card that can one-shot a Giant for free is very good in its own right. Uh, I think that you'll find this build is very good at the lower ranks, rank 4, 3, 2, 1, maybe in Legend. But the way Hunter's sitting right now, it just doesn't seem like an anti-control variant is where you want to be. So, um, 
what basically what we've illustrated in all this is that Shaman is a very versatile deck. It seeks to value out its opponents. Uh, has good strength in the late game, but hitting its crux of power in the middle turns five, six, seven, where you can cast your um, elementals, your doom hammers, uh, just really go bananas with your cards. And we have great board clear, and this is a great deck to play against a very flexible metagame, where you have extreme aggro deck on one side and extreme control decks on the other. So I definitely think this is where I want to be when I'm playing, and I have to thank MIT for sending me this deck, because it's definitely excellent. Alright guys, if you enjoyed the video, thank you so much for watching and getting this far. Uh, please follow me at Twitter, Eric underscore Kreider, or on Twitch at Polish King underscore. Uh, thank you so much. Subscribe. I, I don't know where the button is, but I appreciate it. And uh, good luck on the field of battle. We'll be back next week with another series. Thank you very much for watching.